so there's a lot of different, I guess, dietary strategies out there to 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 help create a, a calorie deficit and and promote weight loss. And there's a lot of debate and fighting between low fat and high fat and you know, different styles of of kind of dietary restriction. I'm assuming that your view here is that the best option for at least some people, and we can go into who that might be or might not be, is to utilize a sort of one of these very low calorie diet, intensive, you know, short duration. It's not a lifetime thing. You kind of rob the bank, or I think you say in your book, seven days to slay the monster. Um, is, is that where you're at that if, if you had prediabetes or you had type two diabetes, that you think that's the most effective strategy for someone to adopt from a dietary point of view? Yes, on average. Although individuals may have individual preferences, circumstances may vary so that other, other ways may suit, but there are some really important points to make about achieving weight loss. The most important thing is that you achieve it. And so setting this goal of 15 kilograms weight loss for most people in the overweight or obese range is important. You realize how much you've got to lose. Now, just fiddling with the components of food, raising or lowering this or that, is not going to achieve that. You need to have a very substantial cut back in, say, uh, the fat content of food, which would make it unpalatable for many people. The carbohydrate content of food, well, certainly in the UK, very low calorie diet, very low carbohydrate diets are quite unpopular. They're not sustainable as people actually feel they need some modest amount of carbohydrate. So changing the composition is not terribly good in general. However, there are as many successful diets as there are different individuals, and some people really don't mind a low-fat diet. Some people don't mind missing out all carbohydrate foods, but they're few and far between. And that's why randomized studies randomize people to a group of this diet compared with that diet. But of course, in this group, just imagine you've got half the people that suit the one and not the other. And in the other group, you've got half the people that suit uh, the other and not the one. And so they end up having results that are 49, 51%. And so it's very understandable that there's confusion in this area. So how to approach it? Well, for the individual, you've got to suck it and see. I would advise going for the low calorie diet, getting rid of the type 2 diabetes. That's the go getting aim. But if for some reason that's unfeasible or found to be absolutely impossible, then why not try one of the other methods? The Mediterranean-style eating with low-carb is probably the best uh, researched, and intermittent fasting is probably uh, the second best researched and used in practice. Other forms of dieting entirely possible. Let's move to the other extreme for the moment and take the celebrity diets. A celebrity says, well, you know, what I did was to only eat kiwi fruits and absolutely nothing else. Well, it somehow suited them. Maybe they are not being quite straight in reporting the total amount of weight they lost due to that alone. Uh, maybe there was assistance from other, uh, other means. So, any diet can work if it suits the individual. And we have to mention at this point, there are other ways of losing weight. In extremists, if people have tried all the methods and they find the appetite drive still uh, produces failure, well, there's bariatric surgery, which is very successful, although does have a higher complication rate than surgeons admit to. And then we've got the new magic drugs. Well, no drug is magic. 
These come along with side effects and have got to be used carefully and properly. But if used carefully and properly, then they can achieve weight loss, and they too would do the bit. So we've got a range of measures. My work has established what can be done within the constraints of the NHS, as that is a very severely cash-limited service, cash-restricted service, you might say. And uh, I had to demonstrate for a thing to be useful, it had to be low cost. And this is a highly cost-effective way of going about weight loss, which makes it suitable for healthcare systems. And just to clarify, the the kind of magic drugs you're talking about there are drugs like GLP-1 agonists like Ozempic, um, which I'm sure a lot of people have have heard of. And to kind of, I guess, underscore a point that, there that you made about diet studies and how they may have certain people randomized to a group who do well on a certain macronutrient ratio, some that do poorly, and then in the opposite arm, the same thing. I previously had Professor Christopher Gardner on the show, and he spoke exa- to exactly that point about diet fits. And one of the interesting things that they looked at, um, and that was a 12-month low-carb versus low-fat trial, and I know that you'll be aware of it, um, but the average weight loss was not significantly different, but when you went in and looked at the waterfall plots, you did see on each arm, some people did poorly on low fat, some did well. And same thing with low carb. Um, So to your point, at this stage, without being able to predict who's going to do best on low carb or low fat, then the individual can kind of play around with it and see what feels easiest um, for, for them. I do wonder though, in one context, Roy, whether there is an advantage to a low carb diet. So if we come back to the person that's had type two diabetes for quite a while and their pancreas is just completely beat out, they can't produce insulin, even if they're they're losing weight, they're one of those people that are not entering remission. Do you think that is a context where a reduced carbohydrate diet might have an advantage? Sure, but it depends what level you're starting from. And that's the whole point. The matter of low carb, the whole debate has been uh, made complicated by the fact that people were talking about different things. Now, in the UK, we're talking about perhaps 55% carbohydrate consumption on average. That means some people are taking 65, 70. For them, it will make a huge difference to uh, the diabetes as you describe it to drop down to, say, 45, which is a very sane uh, level. If someone was tootling along at 45% carb intake, dropping it further probably won't make a huge amount further difference because uh, there the body is coping and it needs a certain amount of carbohydrate uh, to function optimally. And so... We've got this difficult matter of what is excess. Certainly, uh, having sugar-sweetened beverages is an obvious excess that can be cut out. Adding sugar to tea and coffee, don't do it. Taking desserts, well, perhaps uh, in limited quantities. How about the big sources of carbohydrate, that is, potato, rice, pasta, bread? Well, that needs to be looked at. And it's certainly sane to have a moderately carbohydrate-reduced diet. Probably the ideal is a Mediterranean-style diet, in other words, lots of salad, uh, non-starchy veg products, and moderate uh, carbohydrate reduction. (laughs) 